The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans who've been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity have succeeded. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Herman Edwards, the coach of the New York Jets of the NFL. Hi, Herman. Glad to have you with us. How you doing, Dr. Brown? You certainly have captivated New York with your leadership style, your confidence, your optimism, and your leadership. So I'm going to ask you right off the bat, what is the element of your leadership style? I think the first thing you have to do, uh, any, any good leader understands that uh, he can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you have to surround yourself with good people that you trust mm -hmm. and then have the ability to delegate certain mm -hmm. things that you feel need to be done by qualified mm -hmm. people. I think if you can do that, uh, that builds a team, that builds trust, and it gives you an opportunity mm -hmm. really to go amongst what I call the troops mm -hmm. and the players and, and, and really familiarize yourself mm -hmm. with, with those uh, players. Well, you had a particular situation in the season where the team had lost a few games, and you gave a speech, <laughs> which everybody is talking about, that you can win, you believe in yourself, you will. What was the the genesis of that? What caused you to do that at that time? Well, I think the message f for, for myself and I think for our staff was very, very clear was understand the vision and don't let the circumstances mm -hmm. dictate what the vision needs to become. Mm -hmm. And our, our vision has always been to win. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very, very important. I think uh, you play the game mm -hmm. to win. I mean, that's, that's why you play. Mm -hmm. That's why they keep score. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. You play it to win. And I just think that when you're losing and you go mm -hmm. through a losing period, you lose a lot of your confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear all the criticisms, you hear all the uh, people telling you what you should do, you should do this and do that. It's amazing how many people become coaches when you lose <laughs> and they have an answer for you. Particularly when they have season yeah, tickets. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, what I was trying to really make the team understand is understand the vision, and the vision is to win. Mm -hmm. And how do we go about doing that? And, and really don't mm -hmm. deal with the circumstances because all of a sudden mm -hmm. the circumstances, if you let them, they become your vision. Mm -hmm. You, 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 have to, you have to let that alone and just mm -hmm. understand that this is what it's going to take for us to win. And I think the players mm -hmm. bought into that, and obviously we, we turned the season around. You have a very good coaching staff, uh, both offense and defense special teams. And as a leader, do you tell them what to do, or do you <laughs> follow what they suggest you do? How does that work? Well, it works basically. Uh, <laughs> we kind of huddle up, and, and, and there's a chain of command, obviously. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I, it probably starts with, with myself, and there's mm -hmm. certain things that I believe in, certain things that uh, mm -hmm. obviously uh, I want them to, to, to do, mm -hmm. and then from there uh, they go out and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th it's not that I, I'm a ruler, mm -hmm. uh, but there's a vision I have, mm -hmm. and we all have to be on the same vision, mm -hmm. and I think that's very, very important. And you do that by communi communicating to your coaches first because they have to carry yeah, the message right. f from the head coach to the players. But different coaches have different philosophies. Some coach might be more offensively oriented. Some might be more defensively oriented. It, from my view as a season ticket holder, you sort of balance the two. Uh, how do you work out? How do you work out that balance between your offense and your defense? Well, obviously, my strong hand is on on defense. Obviously, I, I grew you, up a defensive player. You were player. defensive right. DB yeah, your right. whole yeah. life, and I've right. always coached on the defensive side. But but I also understand offense, and and what I try to do. In the course of the week, obviously, there's certain times when the offenses meets and the defense meet, and, and I make sure that they meet at different times, mm -hmm. especially on the offseason, to start discussing about what mm -hmm. we're going to do next year. And, and generally, when the defense is meeting, I'm in there with the defense, and then when the offense is not meeting, they're working on college stuff, mm -hmm. like at the, this point of the season, working on a college draft. Mm -hmm. And then in the afternoon, they flip it. Where the, where the defensive coaches go in and work on the college draft and the offense starts working on our mm -hmm. offense and I go into that meeting. So uh, that's how you kind of handle it. You have to split your time. You have to understand uh, that there's only so much time in the day and you have to make sure you're very efficient with your time. Well, what about the competition between the offense and defense? <laughs> Some teams have really fallen apart because the defense blames the offense and the offense blames the defense. How do you deal with that? Well, I think you deal with it in the fact that uh, we know it's a team and, and mm -hmm. the Jets don't play the Jets. Mm -hmm. uh, we really don't and, and we don't compete against each mm -hmm. other. Uh, we, we try to make a good blend of what we do with offense, defense, and special teams. And I think our coaching staff understands that. The players understand it. They understand that we need each other. It's, a, it's really a, mm -hmm. a, a three pope uh, prong system, if you if you would, will say that it's offense, mm -hmm. defense, and special teams, and we all work together. And I think if you can work together for the common goal, and the common goal is to win, and without mm -hmm. those three phases working mm -hmm. together, uh, you really don't have a team. 
Now, you have this great philosophy. How did you get this philosophy? Who influenced you along the way? I know your parents did, first right. of all. Right. You were an army brat, I right. believe. Exactly. Yeah. So well, how many different places did you live when you were growing well, up? Well, we were very fortunate. I was obviously, I was born in New Jersey, Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, on the army base. And then from there, we went to Germany, uh, came back and lived in mm -hmm. California from there mm -hmm. on, and, and re really grew up in California. Mm -hmm. uh, Fort Ord, California, we were stationed there on an Army base and then mm -hmm. uh, moved uh, to Seaside, which is a little community right next door to the Army base, and grew up there on, mm -hmm. on the Monterey Peninsula, basically. And then from there, uh, went on uh, and became a college athlete, went to the University of California, Berkeley uh, first. and was a little bit of a renegade. Mm -hmm. I left there after my junior year, yeah. went to San Diego <laughs> State, finished there, and then obviously went to... Uh, uh, to Philadelphia Eagles and started my playing career. Mm -hmm. But I think my influence on, on coaching has been done over the years. Uh, I had a good high school coach mm -hmm. that I thought influenced me a lot about the details. And, and we were a very detailed uh, football team. Mm -hmm. uh, there was about six young players off that team obviously went to college and six mm -hmm. that went to play pro football really? off a high school mm -hmm. team. And, and, and we were very simple. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't do a lot of things, but we did the, the things really well. And I think he really taught me a lot about mm -hmm. technique and fundamentals at an mm -hmm. early age. From there, uh, when I went to San Diego State, and then from there, under Dick Vermeil in my pro career, I thought he was a mentor for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, when I went to Kansas City, obviously my first coaching job there was under uh, Marty Schottenheimer and Carl Peterson. Mm -hmm. And then from there, working under Tony Dungy in Tampa. So I was influenced by a mm -hmm. lot of coaches. I've been blessed uh, to have a lot of opportunities and take advantage of those opportunities. Well, you certainly have. That group of people <laughs> you mentioned as mentors, but the most important thing I heard you say was the role of your high school coach, the details, the learning of the principles, uh, the physical fitness, because uh, I've always said, I used to coach myself, that the smartest team wins, <laughs> the smartest and best conditioned team wins. And sm being smart means attending to those detail, uh, details, you know, how you want to play your people and so on. Exactly. And so I, I could see that in your influence. The other thing is, I guess because of your personality, uh, people want to listen to you. <laughs> well, I when think you show uh, that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you have to have energy, uh, especially in football. Mm -hmm. I, I truly believe. And you have to love what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, been, I've been very, very mm -hmm. fortunate. Uh, Long ago, when I was a young guy, I, I kind of, my vision was to be a football player. Mm -hmm. It was no, no doubt about it. I mm -hmm. mean, I was going to go to college and all that, but mm -hmm. my aspirations mm -hmm. were no doubt about it. That vision was very, very focused. It was I was going to be a mm -hmm. professional football player. And uh, if I was given the opportunity, I was going to show everybody I could do it. And obviously, I was given that opportunity. From there, when I got into the league, in the National Football League, uh, my vision was clear. I was going to be a coach. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew that. I wanted to give something back to the game. Mm -hmm. I really did. And give, give something back to the players because the game has really taken care of me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really has. I've been in this league now in the professional side of it for 24 years, really? coaching and playing. Mm -hmm. So That's half of my life I've been in pro football. Yeah. So I, I owe something to pro yeah. football. There's no doubt about it. And if I can give something back to the young players, uh, something I've learned along the way, uh, how you conduct yourself, probably the most important thing. Uh, you know, and how it's an honor, and it's no one's right but a privilege to be a part of the National Football League. Now, who was your role model <coughs> when you <laughs> wanted to be a pro football player? My role model was Paul Robeson. Okay. Paul Robeson, the great political activist, the great singer, the All-American, the Phi Beta Kappa. <laughs> that when I grew up, many black youth had Paul Robeson mm -hmm. as our role model. Now, who was your role model in the football side? Well, league? on the football side, really, uh, the first guy I really watched uh, when I was young, I watched a TV program, it was Jim Thorpe, mm -hmm. believe it or not, a Native American, mm -hmm. and uh, watched him as he was an athlete. Uh -huh. and, and, and I was kind of in, enthused about that, about this guy being an athlete. He mm -hmm. could do it all. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in my mind saying I was going to be a guy like that. I was going to be an athlete. It wasn't just a football player, yeah. but could play all the sports. And, and, and went on my journey trying to do that. Yeah. And, and it was a probably a fairly decent athlete growing up. Mm -hmm. But then from there, I think I was influenced a lot, not by football guys, but, but really outside of football. Mm -hmm. You're talking about Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of my, one of the guys I looked, mm -hmm. looked, looked at in the fact that he took a stand. Mm -hmm. You know, and that kind of threw me back. Here's a guy that was the greatest fighter of all, mm -hmm. uh, coming up in the prime of his life, and took a stand mm -hmm. in something he believed in. Whether mm -hmm. it was right, wrong, or different, he was willing mm -hmm. to give it up. And, and that, that showed me a lot about him, mm -hmm. that he was willing to take a stand in what he believed in. Mm -hmm. uh, now, obviously, you know, uh, now you look at Muhammad Ali, and 
he could walk in any place, any country, and he's welcomed. Uh, back then, he probably wasn't welcomed in America mm -hmm. a lot at that point in time for what he stood for and what he believed in. But uh, that was probably the influence mm -hmm. for me to go to Cal Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you went to Cal Berkeley uh, early in the in the early 70s. You go to talk protest. About, yeah, People <laughs> Park and Angela Davis uh -huh. and Eldridge Cleaver yeah. and the Black Panther Party. Yeah. I mean, they were on campus every yeah. day. So I, I think you would sit there and listen to mm -hmm. them, you know, and wonder, well, well, what are they talking mm -hmm. about? You know, but I think that was an influence on me to really understand where other people's opinions were coming from mm -hmm. and then form your own opinions mm -hmm. uh, about what kind of man you were going to become and, 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 and how I thought I was going to try to do my best as, as a black American and uh, really uh, make sure that I was doing mm -hmm. the right thing for the right reasons. It's interesting that three great black athletes, Paul Robeson, Jackie Robinson, and Muhammad Ali, have taught America the lessons of freedom, democracy, equality, challenge, struggle. Those are three great men to have as role models. Clearly, folks like you are going to be role models for the youth of tomorrow. But it's very interesting that as the economic situation has changed regarding athletes, we have a number of athletes who are so enticed by the money <laughs> that they forget their obligation to the community. And I know with your team, you have a lot of high-paid players. <laughs> they all make more money than you do. <laughs> but how do you keep them focused on service? The quality of life for people is dependent upon the service they provide to a society. How do you get your players with all this good <laughs> glamour and so on to focus on that? Well, you're right, and, and I think the, the point I, I try to make them understand is it's very, very important in life that uh, uh, you work to make a living, but what you give is to make your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when, when I tell players that, I make them understand that uh, the reason you're here is because someone mm -hmm. gave you an opportunity. Mm -hmm. First of all, God gave you the ability to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but then the opportunity was given to you along the way. Mm -hmm. uh, you didn't do this by you yourself. Didn't do it by yourself. Uh, mm -hmm. You need to know that right away. Mm -hmm. And I think our players understand that. Uh, I think for the most part, our players understand that we have to be a part of the community because we are role models, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. When you chose this profession, when you chose to be a professional athlete, mm -hmm. you became a role model, mm -hmm. whether you like it or not. And, and I, I truly, I like it. Mm -hmm. I think it's good because it, it, it creates a standard that you must live by every day, not just on the football field, but off the field. And I think that's very, very important, important for us as athletes and, and coaches to understand that, that people look at you and, and you're, you are set apart. And, and there's a standard that you have to, to deal with that is, that is a little bit different than everyone else's. And you're judged a little bit different than everyone else. And I think that's a good thing because you can do some things that other people can't mm -hmm. because you have a platform to serve. And I think that's what you under have to understand that. The and you accept it. <coughs> See, there are some athletes and even some coaches who don't truly understand and accept that. <laughs> now, as an African-American, you are a role model not only to all youth, but particularly African-American youth. And African-Americans in the society with the racism that exists have had a tough struggle. There are only, what, four or five African-American coaches in the NFL. There have only been about six or seven the whole damn thing. Although it's interesting that the first African-American pro coach was Fritz Pollard right. with the Providence Steamrollers back in 1922. Mm -hmm. Fritz Pollard was sort of a contemporary of Paul Robeson. He went to Brown. He was a great punt returner and so on. And he was a great baseball player, too, a track and field mm -hmm. guy. And he was the first, and from that time on until, I guess, Archell, there really weren't any African-American right. head coaches. Exactly. And I imagine the responsibility, covert or overt, on you and the other African-American coaches, uh, Tony, for example, Tony Dungy, mm -hmm. it must be tremendous. Uh, how do you <laughs> respond to that? Well, I think you respond to it in a way that, uh, obviously, you want to be looked upon as a coach, coach first of number all. One. I think mm -hmm. that's the most important for us. And mm -hmm. I think there's a standard that I think that we understand mm -hmm. that, we, that, that, that we have to accept, mm -hmm. that, that we are a black coach, and at times you're viewed that way. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't view ourselves that way at all. Mm -hmm. We view ourselves as coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, for the most part, uh, it's tough if, if, you, if you view it that way. Mm -hmm. If you just view it as, hey, I'm the, I'm the coach, and I need to win games, <laughs> yeah. and this is what I'm going to do to yeah. win games, <laughs> then you really don't get caught up in that mm -hmm. other stuff. Because if you do, it really it, it enhances your ability to, to visualize on what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. And I think for the most part, you know that at times um, 
you're looked upon a little different. Mm -hmm. You might be judged a little bit different, mm -hmm. but you really don't worry about that. But because I, I think in America, as we all know, uh, as a young as a young person, uh, especially when I grew up, you knew that there was a little difference mm -hmm. that, that you might have to run 12 yards instead of mm -hmm. uh, 10 yards to make a first down. Mm -hmm. you, you, you understood mm -hmm. that. Uh, so that that wasn't mm -hmm. that it, it really wasn't a bothersome mm -hmm. to you just say, well, that's what I got to do. Oh, OK, well, that, that's the way it is. Now, is it getting better? Obviously, it, it is getting a lot better. But but I grew up with that mindset mm -hmm. that I was always going to have to do a little extra. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that was right, wrong or different, whether I felt that way because of my color of my skin or did I feel that way because I wanted to be the best. Mm -hmm. To me, I wanted to be the best, and, and if that if I had to go a little a little bit more further, then I was I was willing to do that. See, I grew up in a generation before you, and we had the same idea, the same challenge. I went to Dunbar High School in Washington D.C. We were taught to be the best we could, but we had to be smarter. We had to work harder. I was a Tuskegee Airman. I was a squadron commander when I was 23 years old. You had to be better in order to let people know what you can do. <laughs> And eventually you get to the point where you, your challenge is there. You know it's there, but you don't let it stop you. Exactly. Now, today, our young people have all kind of images. They have Colin Powell, and they have Herman Edwards, and they have uh, artists in the visual field on the stage, Danny Glover and so on. I wonder how that affects their motivation do they really think that it's just going to happen because <laughs> it happened to them <laughs> or do they realize that even today uh, African Americans really have a harder challenge well, you you have to have the ability to really to choose what to I always learned this surround yourself with the people that you want to be around mm -hmm. first of that's all. a good that, point. that's probably the first <laughs> thing you very need to do. Point. surround yourself <laughs> you know like I always tell I, I tell players all the time choose your friends mm -hmm. Don't let them choose you. Mm -hmm. I think that's very, very important mm -hmm. in life. And then from there, you, you have to understand what are you willing to sacrifice mm -hmm. for your opportunity mm -hmm. to succeed. So you have to give up something. You really do in life. To, to, to succeed at anything, you mm -hmm. have to be willing to sacrifice something so you can move on to the next level of mm -hmm. wh whatever that is in your life. And I think you can see all these successful uh, black, black actors, mm -hmm. football players, uh, coaches, businessmen, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. they all made sacrifices mm -hmm. to, 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 be, to be who they are. They, 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 they had to sacrifice something. Mm -hmm. It won't come easy. You have to work for it. My dad taught me a, a real good lesson when I was a young man. Uh, he gave me a broom. He gave me a broom one day. And he said, son, he says, I'm going to give you some chores. He said, you go sweep the backyard. He said, I'll pay you. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, I was seven years old. I go back there and I'm sweeping. I get all this stuff swept up and I sweep it in the middle. And he walks out. He says, you think you did a good job? Mm -hmm. I said, I did a great job, Dad. You know, my chest is all poked out. So he starts walking around. Right. He looks at the corner. He said, you missed the corner, <laughs> son. It. And I said, Dad, no one knows. He says, you, you know. know. <laughs> he said, those are the details. Yeah. So he taught me about details, about mm -hmm. how important the details were. Mm -hmm. But then you know what he said after that that really stuck with me? He said, son, you see this broom? And I, and I said, yeah, he said, no matter what success you achieve in life, he said, never be afraid of this broom. Mm -hmm. And what he meant, because it, mm -hmm. was, it was work. Right, he right. had to work. work. That's right. And if you, if you don't have the ability mm -hmm. to do that, you, you won't be successful. Yeah. You're exactly right. But the question that happens today, many of our young people are in schools that are not really functioning. They have gangs. They have... Uh, music that doesn't, uh, misogynist music and so on. And unless they have a strong parent like Herman Edwards or a strong role model in the Boys and Girls Club uh, leader, uh, they get lost. And the thing that I'm particularly concerned about is the role of the media in projecting more negative images than positive images. Many of the programs project this misogynist uh, um, type of language. Um, Herman Edwards helps to challenge that. Every time you stand on the sideline, stand in tall in terms of crisis, you challenge that. But how do we get, not necessarily more Herman Edwards and Roscoe Brown, how do you get some of our 
younger leaders to take on that responsibility? I'm sure you must have some on your team. Who well, and that. I think we do, but I, I think it's not, it's pro it probably doesn't get out to the community as much as mm -hmm. it should. I think in our society, we know one thing, mm -hmm. negativity sells. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've learned a long time ago, misery loves company. Mm -hmm. And most people are not happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, you know, they, they read the paper and they, they read about this and oh yeah, and it, it, it makes them feel good because mm -hmm. a lot of times uh, they don't feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think there's a lot of young people that are doing good things. A lot they, of young uh, really, they really are. Actually, most of them are doing yeah. good yeah. things. <laughs> it's it's the, that fringe percentage. Sure. It's but it can, in certain subsets, take over. Exactly. And you have gangs and you have other kind of antisocial activities. My view is that athletics is a good way to break through this. Athletics with good leadership. Yes. I mean, you're right. You say you want to win, but really the first thing you want to do is play the game. Absolutely. And play the game the best you can, and the consequence of that is at least you win more than you lose. Exactly. That's and I think you make a great point. Athletics bonds together a lot of people, and it makes you understand uh, team. Mm -hmm. It makes mm -hmm. you understand that uh, you're ac you're held accountable. Mm -hmm. See, when you when you be when you get into athletics, you're, you're held accountable. All of a sudden, people are counting on you mm -hmm. to do something. Uh, you've become a part of a, of a of a team, a part of a family. Uh, black, white, it doesn't really matter. We're all in the same. We're we're all in the same room. We're all going after the same thing. And I think that's unique about sports. Uh, I've, I've always said that. I said that probably the greatest thing about our sports, football, is that after every play. You get in the huddle and you have to hold hands. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it doesn't really matter what religion you yeah. are, what color you are. Yeah. It's just you're listening to the quarterback mm -hmm. and he's telling you what the play is. And everyone's looking yeah. at that guy going, okay, yeah. hey, you know what? We got to do this right if we want to move this ball. Yeah. And I think that's what's great about athletics, period, is that you're accountable now. You're held accountable to your teammates. And, and that's a good thing. Yeah. As you were talking about getting in the huddle and holding hands, you have these instant offenses now where the coach radios in <laughs> to the quarterback, what are you supposed to do? And then he calls them oh, yeah. some signals, yeah. and the players on the field have to respond, which means they have to be smart. Sure. And, and uh, they have to do their homework, and they have to be able to react. Now, how do you get some of these folks who may not have been great students in college to be smarter? Or is it that ones that are not smart don't survive? Well, no, I think what you have to do is you have to, there's, all, there, there's different ways to teach people. And I think mm -hmm. that's the first thing you find out about your players. Mm -hmm. Some guys are visually better than mm -hmm. they are on the field. And, and mm -hmm. some guys Good. are better on the chalkboard. But whatever it takes, mm -hmm. and that's where the coaching comes in, mm -hmm. you need to find out how you can make your players the best they can be, mm -hmm. obviously. And the way you do that, it starts in the classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, what can this guy handle? You know, how mm -hmm. long are the meetings going to be with mm -hmm. these players? I mean, all those little things you think about where you can keep their attention span. How are you going to teach them? You don't teach every player the same way. That's, you uh, don't teach every kid the same no, way. No, you can't right. do that. Uh, mm -hmm. So you know, I don't believe in uh, people are dumb. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't buy that. Because when, when, they're here. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't believe that. Yeah, when, when a coach walks in and says, the guy's are dumb, I said, no, 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 the no, coach is dumb. No, because no, the coach, you got to teach the player. The player's right. not dumb. Mm -hmm. we got to find a way to teach him. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone w has the ability to learn. It's just, mm -hmm. do you have enough patience to find out mm -hmm. how to teach him? You'd be a great professor. <laughs> In fact, you are a professor. <laughs> <laughs> professor Pigskin. Yeah, exactly. Great. But exactly. seriously, the, the uh, uh, messages that you're sending are the messages that we in education, we work in urban education, are trying to send to our teachers, that there's no one learning style. Not every kid learns the same way, that everyone has a basic intrinsic ability, and it's the job of the teacher to bring it out. The tendency sometimes is to blame the child or to blame the parent. The true parents do have some responsibility, sure. a lot of responsibility. But it's really up to the teacher. And when I hear you talking, <laughs> I go through when I used to teach statistics. Right. Not everybody learns statistics the same way. Right. But eventually, when we got to the finish line, the end of the course, they didn't know how to do it. Right. And that really is the, the key to this. Now, what do you think about the coming season? You've got a challenge. You've been to the playoffs twice. <laughs> You've been the, the best coach and so <laughs> on. And now people, the expectations are up here. And I know that's a challenge that you mm -hmm. relish, but how do you plan to go into the next season? Well, obviously, the first thing you understand is uh, 
you're going to have a new team. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to acquire new players, whether you like it or not, yeah, because with the of the free system. Agency yeah, and the sure. System, so. And I think after our first year, we were 10 and 6. Mm -hmm. We lost 15 players, mm -hmm. six starters, believe it or not. And then mm -hmm. when this year we come back and and we obviously get in the playoffs, win the division, mm -hmm. and and win our first playoff game. And we're probably going to lose about 12, 13 players mm -hmm. this year. Uh, that's part of the process, but I just think the expectation expectations are great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, they're wonderful. Right. But, but I think the first expectation we have to meet as a football team is understand mm -hmm. that whoever we bring in here, the the next new 12 players, we have to come together as a team, mm -hmm. very quickly. That's probably the most important mm -hmm. thing. I believe this. I believe that teams win. Mm -hmm. Teams, not teams, individuals. Not right. individuals. Teams mm -hmm. win, and, and the and the faster we can understand what the new players we bring in mm -hmm. here bring to this football team mm -hmm. to add on to what we had last year now you got a chance mm -hmm. and that's what we have to we we, we have to find that quickly we, we didn't find that quickly last year we struggled early mm -hmm. uh, that was mm -hmm. a little bit of our problem early mm -hmm. we, we weren't cohesive as a football mm -hmm. team once we got that team together mm -hmm. uh, we accomplished a lot of things where a lot of people didn't think we can do we, we were able to do but we did it because we hung together as a team uh, so that's my first thing on the agenda. But see, because you did so well, you got a tougher schedule this year. Oh yeah, than you yeah. Had well, last year, yeah. <laughs> you start out with we, with we, the, we started with the Redskins, believe it or not. Oh, right. Opening uh, Thursday team. night uh, uh, national game uh -huh. uh, down in uh, RFK, and uh, obviously uh, uh, they've taken a few of our players, yeah. so that'll make it <laughs> that'll more make dramatic. It more, more, more uh, but really, <laughs> it'll be the team that really executes the mm -hmm. best, uh, and really that. Uh, doesn't beat yourself mm -hmm. early in the season. You know that, and mm -hmm. I think that uh, uh, we'll be ready for the game. There's no doubt about it. Okay, as we come to the close of the program, what message would you like to send to youth? What is your message to young people today? I think my, my message is uh, have a dream mm -hmm. and then find a way to achieve it. Mm -hmm. And there's people that will help you. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't ever think you can do it by yourself, mm -hmm. you know, be, be, because you, you can't. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think uh, th there's great opportunities for young people uh, in, 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 our, in our society. And, and it's just a matter of you dreaming the dream and then finding a way to, to live it. And I think th that's what life's about. Okay, well, Herman Edwards certainly has dreamed the dream and is living it. <laughs> so thanks again to Herman Edwards, head coach of New York Jets, for being with us on today's African-American Legends. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you.